As I wrapped up my fighter guide, I realized that I hadn't covered as many of the martial archetypes as I really would have liked to have by this point now. And whenever I was looking through the old videos that I covered, uh, it was just on like older equipment and maybe some opinions of mine have changed, you know, whatever. So I'm going to go through and do some more of the subclass guides, update some old ones and give you all my new and updated perspective on a lot of these. I'm also aiming to make the subclass guides a bit more condensed and hopefully they won't go any longer than about like 10 minutes or so. So with that being said, let's go over into the Arcane Archer. This is one that I have previously covered on the channel, but again, I think it's worth me looking at it again, especially while I've got Fighter fresh, fresh in my mind. Actually, before we go over to D&D Beyond, I'm going to try something a little bit new here. and I'm going to throw the call to action right up front. All right. Hey, so I do a lot of homebrew design here on the channel. I am a professional third party content creator. So I do a lot of design live streams here. You're getting my kind of perspective as a designer on the official options and my kind of perspective into how you would play one of these in the quote unquote meta of D&D. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, go check out some other videos. Subscribe if you haven't already. Drop the like, all that good business. Let's do all the YouTube things. But anyways, all right, with that out of the way, let's go over and look at the Arcane Archer. All right, those of you that have been around know the drill, color rating system right up there. Now the Arcane Archer, we won't really get too into the flavor text. I think that the class name really kind of evokes exactly what this is supposed to be. Uh, this one has had some complaints over the years about the fact that it has a very, very limited resource pool in its arcane shot. Uh, we will get into that here in just a second. Overall, this is one that I would say talk some stuff over with your DM before you're going to play this one. I would personally recommend giving it at least one more use of arcane shot, probably around 10th level, maybe a third or a fourth one rather whenever you get to like 18th. There's some aspects of this one that doesn't really gel quite right with what you would assume this fighter is going to be picking up in the archery fighting style. So uh, we'll talk about that whenever we get there. But starting out here at third level, you're going to get your arcane archer lore. You learn magical theory or some secrets of nature typical for practitioners of this elven martial tradition. You choose to gain proficiency in either the arcana or the nature skill. And you choose to learn either the prestidigitation or the druidcraft cantrip. Prestidigitation and Druidcraft have pretty minor combat relevance there, but they are two of the best quote-unquote shenanigan cantrips in the game. They've got all kinds of fun stuff you can do with them outside of combat. Druidcraft does have a pretty nice, like, meteorologist type effect in here where you can tell what the weather is going to be in the next 24 hours. I think that that's really cute. It can make you actually a pretty good guide overall, uh, but the proficiency there with Arcana or Nature, sure, that's here. It's pretty nice. I think that the most useful part of this is actually going to be probably the cantrips, but yeah, either way, this is supposed to be some of the flavor it's evoking here. The arcane shot is supposed to be your big core thing. Here at third level, you learn to unleash special magical effects with some of your shots. When you gain this feature, you learn two arcane shot options of your choice. See the arcane shot options below. Once per turn, when you fire an arrow from a short bow or long bow, as part of the attack action, you can apply one of your arcane shot options to that arrow. You decide to use this option when the arrow hits a creature. I'm going to stop right here. That's actually like one of the best ways that this could apply right here. If you know that the attack hits, you're not wasting a use of this. So I think that that does actually bring up a little bit of the power behind like why they were limiting it to two. I, I can kind of see the justification there, but yeah, ugh. Unless the option doesn't involve an attack roll. You have two uses of this ability, which is, in my opinion, the weakest part of this right here. And you regain all extended uses of it when you finish a short or long rest. So typically in combat, we can assume that an average combat is going to go about three to four rounds. If you're getting optimal resting out of this, where like, yeah, after every single combat, your party is able to get all their short rest resources back which is what the game was kind of intended to do for you, at least, then, like, this is going to be pretty decent, at least, you know, twice, maybe in every combat, you can reliably do this. But, like, if you're not getting the optimal short resting out of this, then, like, this can kind of feel like you're reluctant to use your core class feature until you come up against the big bad evil guy, right? And that never really feels like a lot of fun. Uh, but you do get additional arcane shot options of your choice when you reach certain levels in this class. 7th, 10th, 15th, and 18th level. 
Okay, so I'm going to pause right here and go up and say right, just right up front, the fighting style that you are most likely going to pick up with this is going to be archery, right? You gain a plus two bonus to attack rolls you make with ranged weapons. Now, it is pigeonholing you into like, this is most likely the thing that you're going to take with it. This is a great fighting style. It just doesn't seem like this fighter is going to embrace some of the other elements of what, like, fighter, yeah. Uh, the fact that this is only once on your turn, I think that this is kind of limiting it to where, like, this isn't going to synergize all that well with Action Surge. You can't Action Surge, use this, pop, and, you know, um... Uh, it's really tricky. A part of me thinks that this may have been better if, like, you did get spell slots in a way, and you could use the spell slots to fuel these arcane shots, or potentially learn, like, a limited pool of spells. It's complicated. This is a subclass that we've been trying to figure out for a little while, like, what the right fix for this is going to be. Because we all can basically agree this has got some problems. Now, the saving throw that you're going to be using for the arcane shots is based off of your intelligence modifier, which I'm kind of knocking as a ding right here because you're, you're now divesting away from what is your core combat ability with dexterity over here to go and pick up intelligence to make sure that these things are going to stay relevant as well. It's tricky. I, I think that this could have really benefited especially since we've seen Rune Knight now rolling out with Constitution as its casting modifier. If this one was at least still going off in Dexterity, I think that, that would be helpful, but uh, yeah, I don't think that this one is multiple ability score dependent, because I usually save that for like four ability scores that you need to improve, but like, uh, yeah, some opinions on that may differ. Uh, but anyways, let's start out from the top of these and go down, Vanishing Arrow, you use Abjuration Magic to try to temporarily banish your target to a harmless location in the Feywild. The creature hit by the arrow must also succeed on a Charisma Saving Throw or be banished. Charisma Saving Throws are really, really not super common at, like, any tiers of play. While banished in this way, the target's speed is zero and it's incapacitated. At the end of its next turn, the target reappears in the space it vacated or in the nearest unoccupied space if that space is occupied. After you reach 18th level in this class, a target also takes 2d6 force damage when the arrow hits it. The strongest portion of this is definitely going to be the action economy and just like turn denial that you're going to provide here with banishing the thing, right? Now that is really strong. The creature who already is pretty much <laughs> totally deficient in the action economy compared to an entire party getting banished, that's pretty huge. Yeah, I think that this one is deserving of a blue. If you are going immediately before the creature, this can be pretty impactful, but like if you're going immediately after it, I guess there's the turn where your party gets to set up and potentially recover a little bit. You are still denying it that turn, and uh, it's, it's tricky. I think that the action economy, the way that that'll play out, however initiative goes, does have some sway on the power of this one. Uh, I don't know. I'd like to hear some stories on that. Beguiling Arrow, I've given this one a blue. Your enchantment magic causes this arrow to temporarily beguile its target. The creature hit by the arrow takes an extra 2d6 psychic damage and choose one of your allies within 30 feet of the target. The target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or it is charmed by the chosen ally until the start of your next turn. This effect ends early if the chosen ally attacks the charmed target, deals damage to it, or forces it to make a saving throw. This is essentially Cupid's arrow right here. It's not becoming charmed by you, it's a creature that you choose. So you can still attack the thing if you do decide to charm it with this thing. Have it target one of your buddies that you know isn't going to be dealing damage to it or whatever. Let's say the party cleric who you know is going to be up healing somebody else. Bam, you pop this on it. Pretty fantastic. The problem with this one comes down to wisdom saving throws being... One of the most common saving throws in the entire game. The fact that charmed immunity does become a bit more frequent later on. And psychic damage, there's some fights where that just feels like it's not really relevant. But like, god, those are pretty rare. I do think that the overall mechanic of what's happening here is actually pretty unique compared to what we've seen in other charm-like effects. I really do dig this one quite a bit. I've given it a blue. I do think that in some combats, this one could lose relevance. And I think at higher tiers of play, this one kind of just gets phased out. Bursting Arrow, I think that this one is definitely a purple. This is probably the strongest and most reliable out of any of these shots. You imbue your arrow with force energy drawn from the School of Evocation. The energy detonates after you attack. Immediately after the arrow hits the creature, 
The target and all other creatures within 10 feet of it take 2d6 force damage each. Remember the way that this worked out earlier, right? Whenever you hit the target, if you take that archery fighting style, bam, the plus two to the attack roll, I mean, it's going to be pretty hard for these not to hit, all right? So after you hit the target, if it's surrounded by anybody else, you can pop this thing, and then there's no save on this, they just take 2d6 force damage. This is always, always, always reliable. If, it, if you're going up against a single target, sure, this might not be the thing that you do. You may want to go for some kind of a debuff happening in any of the other shots, but like, boy, this in a lot of situations is extremely strong. You might say that this one has a negative aspect of it where if you have some frontliners that are up on the creature, then they could get hit by it as well. You might opt for one of your other shot options there, but Bursting Arrow is one that I really recommend. As soon as you pick up this subclass, go and check this one out. Enfeebling Arrow, I've given this one a blue. You weave necromantic magic into your arrow. The creature hit by the arrow takes an extra 2d6 necrotic damage. The target must also succeed on a constitution saving throw, a proficiency that's actually pretty common in some stat blocks, or the damage dealt by its weapon attacks is halved until the start of your next turn. Not bad, I actually like this effect a bit. You are doing the debuffing stuff in here, although... The damage dealt by its weapon attacks, this doesn't apply to spells, and at later tiers of play, creatures with innate spellcasting, or just regular spellcasting, whatever, does become a bit more frequent, and especially with some of the new monsters that we're seeing in, like, Morganekinen's Monsters of the Multiverse, they're just straight up getting spell attacks in their stat block, so this one might be a little bit unreliable later on, and then the necrotic damage is going to increase later on. Grasping Arrow, I'm having a tough time with this one. I know right off the bat because it's dealing poison damage, this one's gotta be, gotta be orange. Uh, when this arrow strikes the target, Conjuration Magic creates Grasping Poisonous Brambles, which wrap around the target. The creature hit by the arrow takes an extra 2d6 poison damage. Its speed is reduced by 10 feet. Pretty great because there's a lot of creatures that are immune to being paralyzed, whatever, but like, there's not a whole lot that are immune to having their speed reduced. So... This is going to be a purple, and it takes an extra 2d6 slashing damage. Now, I've had a question on this one for a little while, and it seems like other people have as well, and I want to say that I think the most reasonable interpretation as to what happens whenever slashing damage is dealt through an arcane shot, the fact that this says that they are all magical effects is what's leading me to believe that all of these should be dealing magical piercing or slashing damage. If that's the case, this is significantly better. Yeah, just straight up. It is significantly better, and I would hope that it's something that you should just be allowing your arcane archer to do. Please, please, please talk to your DM about how you want that to be interpreted. There may be the potential for you to do like a cheese grater mechanic where the creature can potentially just get moved back and forth through the brambles because oh, it would have to be on separate turns. Your party could set that up where it's taking 2d6 slashing damage. If you have a way of just keeping it locked down in there and moving it back and forth. So like there's the potential that this is actually dealing more like 46, if not 66 slashing damage. This could be really, really strong, but uh, wrapping this one up, the target or any creature that can reach it can use its action to remove the brambles with a successful strength athletics check against your arcane shot DC. Otherwise the brambles last for one minute or until you use this option again. If your party's really frontline heavy, this one might suck a little bit. It might make it hard for them to get up and attack this creature, right? But the potential for this to actually do that cheese grater thing, you know, there is definitely an argument to be made that Grasping Arrow, I may just be looking at this as, uh, I see the poison damage and I'm like, no, this is bad. With magical slashing damage involved with it, yeah, I'll bring it up to a blue. I'll, I'll do that. Piercing Arrow. You use transmutation magic to give your arrow an ethereal quality. When you use this option, you don't make an attack roll for the attack. Instead, the arrow shoots forward in a line, which is 1 foot wide and 30 foot long, before disappearing. The arrow passes harmlessly through objects, ignoring cover. Each creature in that line must make a dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, a creature takes damage as if it were hit by the arrow, plus an extra 1d6 piercing damage. On a successful save, the target takes half as much damage. It depends on how much your DM is really factoring in the environment and thinking tactically about 
where they're putting their monsters into like how much love you're going to get out of this, right? So DMs out there, if you've got an arcane archer, do be sure you know about the rules for cover and try to emphasize that to make sure that features like this right here do get some love. Now, outside of that, we do have a, a save for half rather than save or suck. So that's also really nice. If I'm considering this to be magical piercing damage, I think that this is actually one of the better shot options that you can pick up. I do think overall that this one is a pretty nice pickup. It, again, it could be DM dependent, whatever their style is going to be for combat. But Piercing Arrow and Bursting Arrow are two of my favorite options I've seen so far in the Arcane Archer. Seeking Arrow. I like what this one wants to be. Using Divination Magic, you grant your arrow the ability to seek out a target. When you use this option, you don't make an attack roll for the attack. Instead, choose one creature you have seen in the past minute. The arrow flies toward that creature, moving around corners if necessary and ignoring three quarters cover and half cover. If the target is within the weapon's range, and there is a path large enough for the arrow to travel to the target, the target must make a dexterity saving throw. Otherwise, the arrow disappears after traveling as far as it can. On a failed save, the target takes damage as if it were hit by the arrow, plus an extra 1d6 force damage, and you learn the target's current location. On a successful save, the target takes half as much damage, and you don't learn its location. Now, possibly against some invisible creatures that you have seen and then they turn invisible, you could pop this off and it could be useful. I wanted to say for some chase scenarios, this could also be useful. You know, weapon range is going to be pretty massive, actually. Uh, you know, this is most likely going to cover an entire battle map here. So, you know, the, ah, this does seem like it's a restriction where I'm like, this would be really great if it was like, more helpful in chase sequences, but like, uh, realistically, in a combat, I'm sure that this is going to work out for you just fine. It is dealing an additional 1d6 force damage on top of it. I think that this one is closer to purple than blue. Now, Shadow Arrow, here we have our final one. You weave illusion magic into your arrow, causing it to occlude your foe's vision with shadows. The creature hit by the arrow takes an extra 2d6 psychic damage, and it must succeed on a wisdom saving throw, which, by the way, becomes way, way, way more common later on, or be unable to see anything further than five feet away until the start of your next turn. Notice that this is not the blinded condition. This is simply it can't see anything further than five feet away until the start of your next turn, right? So your buddies, I, I like what this wants to do. Your buddies could take the hide action if they want to really super easily with this, the debuff is nice. It can't target allies that it can't see, right? So you cast this on a spellcaster and you've essentially shut down that spellcaster for a turn. I think that that's actually pretty interesting, especially if you're able to break its concentration before this and then it just can't really target anyone with a spell that turn. That's significant. The trade off there being that you are risking, well, you're, you're really banking on it, not being proficient with wisdom saving throws to really get the most out of this, right? This one has got some, oh, it's, it's kind of complicated. I think that I really like the effect here overall. The debuff is very nice. It is the wisdom saving throw. It's a cool effect. I'm going to give it a blue for right now. All right, so with that third level, we can see pretty clearly that this is going to be a backline striker, debuffer. You could say support in some ways, sure. Uh, quasi blaster, I guess, if you go with bursting arrow. So this one is getting a lot of the love out of spellcasting. DMs out there, be generous with this one. I think that it really does need more uses of this. I would argue a number of uses equal to maybe that modifier, like your intelligence modifier to justify that. Yeah, long and short of it, it just needs more uses. Okay, magic arrow, seventh level. You gain the ability to infuse arrows with magic. Whenever you fire a non-magical arrow from a short bow or long bow, you can make it magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks and damage. The magic fades from the arrow immediately after it hits or misses its target. And this is quite nice because this is making it to where here at later levels, this resistance or immunity to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, slashing becomes way more frequent. So this is a viability thing for you right here. Curving Shot, this is actually another feature that you're getting here at 7th level as well as another option that you can take with Arcane Shot. So they actually have a pretty loaded down 7th level despite it feeling like they aren't getting a whole lot right here. But with Curving Shot, you learn how to redirect an errant arrow towards a new target. 
When you make an attack roll with a magic arrow and miss, you can use a bonus action to reroll the attack roll against a different target within 60 feet of the original target. So, this is going to work with the magic arrows that you can fire or potentially ones with arcane shot. This is a reliability thing here, but the fact of me thinking that most likely you're taking the archery fighting style here, I don't know how often this is going to kick on. It is a soft cushion of reliability here. I think that this one may come into play uh, more often than, you know, once or twice in a campaign. You're going to be most likely the most accurate character out there on the battlefield. So, like, I, I guess this is here for you. Yeah. From there, we're going to get another arcane shot at 10th level. And then at 15th level, we're going to get ever ready shot. Starting at 15th level, your magical archery is available whenever battle starts. If you roll initiative and have no uses of arcane shot remaining, you regain one use of it. I still think straight up they could have just used more resources. Even if it was here at 15th level, the only thing that they could have gotten was like, they're getting an additional use of arcane shot. Um, I don't know that I would have rather taken that. This is nice. I think that they can still get a use of arcane shot. And also, if you roll initiative and have no uses of Arcane Shot remaining, you regain one use of it. And I think that this would actually still be pretty alright. You know, honestly, with this one, with the Ever Ready Shot, you can just straight up say, if you roll initiative and have no uses of Arcane Shot remaining, or really, when you roll initiative, you regain all uses of Arcane Shot. And I would have been way happier with it. Um, uh, you really do want the Arcane Archer to just have this available. Um... Yeah, I'm going to give this one a blue. Uh, I don't know that Wizards of the Coast was really fair on this one. I think that they had plenty of power budget to spend, and they just kind of didn't. Arcane Archer. Uh, I think Arcane Archer, despite really liking what some of the Arcane shots want to throw out, everything feels just generally pretty underwhelming. About the highest I really could feel myself putting Arcane Archer is most likely going to have to be in... It needs to be competitive with, like, Battlemaster, and the, the sad truth of it is that it's just not. Battlemaster gets way more resources, and, like, it just feels like all the things that it's getting out of its maneuvers are feeling a bit more unique. Uh, sad thing with Arcane Archer, man. I, I think best that I can give Arcane Archer right now, God, it's got to feel like a really low C, maybe a high D. I'll put it in D for right now. I don't know. I think that there are other options that most likely... You know what? I think Arcane Archer could be defining of what it means to be a C. There are definitely things that I would put below Arcane Archer, like, oh, Four Elements Monk, definitely Berserker Barbarian. Um, I still feel like Enchantment Wizard is probably deserving of being here in this lower tier. Uh, but I don't know that I can really say that Arcane Archer is worth knocking down that far, but I don't know. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. I want to throw a huge shout out to my Patreon sponsors. Thank you all so much for helping me keep the lights on around here and coffee in my blood. You all are absolute heroes. And hey, thank you all so much for being here. I hope you all are staying safe, staying healthy, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.